program talk is an actual math lecture. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, uh, Carlos Koenig. Um, so he's obviously one of the organizers of the program, known to hopefully all of you, but I just want to say a few words about him. So uh, Carlos is the uh, Lewis Block Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, you know, he's won numerous awards. Uh, I'll list the Boucher Prize, the Salem Prize. Uh, he was a Guggenheim Fellow. And he was a plenary speaker at the uh, 2010 ICM and uh, was the chair of the ICM in 2014. So he's uh, a man of great accomplishments, both mathematical and, uh, and really a profound influence in the mathematical world. He certainly has uh, influenced me in his talks and uh, papers, which I've read since the beginning of my career. And uh, I'm really pleased that he was involved in this program at all. And I'm uh, also extremely pleased that he uh, uh, agreed to give this talk. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Carlos Koenig, who will speak on uh, oh. simplification and linear and nonlinear PDE. Hello. Can you hear me? The mic is working, okay. Well, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, let me just warn you, you might regret this. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, I have to say that it's a, not an easy task for me to, to give a general audience lecture, and uh, I've attempted it only once, two years ago, as you can see from the dates on the slides. <laughs> Uh, hopefully, it will work. Uh, it's, a, it's very fortunate for me and for the audience that we had, uh, two days ago, Frank Ferris's talk, in which he introduced many of the things that I'm going to uh, start saying. So it's an introduction to these things. So that was uh, serendipitous. OK, so um, simplification is, a, a, of course, something very desirable. And the general idea that I want to convey is that you may start out with something that has, looks very complicated, but somehow there's a way conceptually to find the simplification. And that will be the first part of the lecture. And the second part of the lecture, uh, it, it will deal with uh, other kinds of phenomena in which what you have to do is wait long enough. And if you wait long enough, then things that look extremely complicated become quite simple. So that's the general moral of the story today. So let me start. Hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah, I was warned I have to aim this. Hmm. It has to be very precisely, <laughs> precisely aimed. OK. So this is the complicated part of the lecture. OK. Uh, so we're going to uh, be discussing two subjects that are uh, very dear to my heart. The first one is Fourier analysis, harmonic analysis, and partial differential equations. And uh, these subjects have been intertwined since their very beginnings, uh, going back to the work of Fourier. Uh, 1768, 1830. Uh, so Fourier was uh, an accomplished person in many ways. He was uh, Napoleon's envoy to Egypt. He was governor of Egypt. And he also found time to, to think about mathematics, physics, and various other things. So uh, let me start this story with the mathematical heat theory of heat conduction that Fourier originated. And uh, what he did was derive an equation, now known as the heat equation, which describes heat flow <coughs> in a one-dimensional bar from New Newton's cooling law, which says that the flow of the heat through a point is proportional to the temperature gradient at the point. <coughs> 
And basically what you want to do is you heat this bar, you keep the temperature constant, and you want to see how the temperature evolves. And that's what the heat equation describes. Okay, so now I have to change pages, so this is very a de delicate process. Okay, so the, the heat equation is this partial differential equation where the partial derivative in T, the first partial equals the second partial in X. And what Fourier did was solve what we call the initial value problem, IVP, for this equation. And what that means is that given the initial temperature of a finite bar, and we keep the ends at constant temperature, we want to calculate the future temperature at any point on the bar. So uh, this was what Fourier set out to do. And in the course of this calculation, he made a claim that has motivated the study of Fourier analysis, harmonic analysis from that point on. And I remind you that our research uh, topic here is harmonic analysis. So this is why uh, this is related to this talk. So what is this claim uh, that Fourier made, which people are studying even today? Fourier made the claim that given any function defined, let's say, on the interval minus pi pi, no matter how capricious its graph is, you can represent it as, as a sum of trigonometric functions, cn e to the i nx, or if you want, cosine nx plus i sine nx. And uh, not only that, but there's a formula to calculate the coefficient cn given the function f, and that's this formula as an integral. It represents the coefficients as an integral. Now, when uh, Fourier made this claim, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this was very controversial. This was in the first half of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 19th century. He made this claim, and people didn't believe it because they said, well, these functions, cosine nx plus i sine nx, they are very nice functions. They're very smooth, they, they look very nice. But at that point in time, they were beginning to be aware of the existence of some very nasty functions. And so <coughs> the, the objection is, how could it be possible to write a very nasty function as a sum of nice functions. This seemed contradictory. And uh, whether this is actually true or not is an issue that is still being investigated. So we don't know the end of the story in this direction. We know many partial answers. And it's one of the main topics of study in harmonic analysis. Okay, so uh, the fortunate thing was that even though Fourier's claim is actually false for all functions, it is true in sufficient generality that the method that he used to solve the heat equation and several related equations, like the uh, wave equation that we saw in Frank's talk on Tuesday, uh, this method actually worked, and it quickly had a, a huge, huge uh, impact on the real world. So there was a huge technological impact of this idea of Fourier, and I can describe some of the applications in the 19th century of this. First, it was then possible to calculate the temperature of the Earth. We know the temperature on the surface of the Earth because we can measure it, and then we can calculate it in the middle of the Earth without digging a hole to the center of the Earth. And uh, that uses Fourier series. The second, uh, the second idea 
The second application I want to mention, and this was fundamental for navigation in the 19th century, was that you could predict the tides using Fourier analysis. So as commerce was mainly done through uh, traffic by sea, this was also of huge importance. The third thing that I'm mentioning here is the construction of what was called the harmonic analyst. So the harmonic analyst is not what most of you think, that is to say the people in this room. In fact, the harmonic analyst was a machine. It was an antecedent to the desk uh, calculators that were used until not so long ago. And it allowed you to compute the Fourier coefficients of certain simple functions. And using that, you could do actual calculations using Fourier's method. The next thing, which has a very interesting uh, story, was it allowed for the construction of the transatlantic cable. So this was a major achievement. Uh, was uh, Lord Kelvin who did this. So uh, there was a company that wanted to construct a transatlantic cable to have telegraphic communication between the United States and Britain. This is uh, what happened. And uh, so they decided that they were going to try to put the cable through the Atlantic to be able to send telegraphic signals. And now there, this was a huge technological challenge because first of all, laying down a cable in the bottom of the Atlantic was not simple. But the key question that they wanted to understand is how do you design the cable? How thick does it have to be? And the second thing, and this was the crucial thing, is what, has the, what does the voltage have to be in order to transmit from one side of the Atlantic to the other? And this company employed two, uh, two engineers for this project. One was Kelvin, and the other one is somebody whose name will disappear from history. And they had a big disagreement as to what the voltage had to be. So the other guy thought that the voltage had to be extremely high. And Kelvin, using Fourier analysis, decided that the best thing was to use very low voltage. So they laid down the first cable, and they used the other guy's prediction. And the cable burnt up. <laughs> so the cable was completely destroyed. And so Kelvin uh, persuaded them that he was right. And they laid the second cable. And that's how the telegraphic communications between Europe and the United States started. <coughs> OK, and uh, the third, or the last, the last advance was that uh, it was then possible to give a, a very accurate estimate to the age of the Earth. Okay. So as you can see, this represented a major uh, pushing forward of, of uh, everyday life, actually. Okay. And this was through Fourier analysis. So let me uh, move on. And uh, the next thing I want to mention here, just briefly, is that if instead of trying to uh, study how heat tr uh, transmits for a finite bar, you look at an infinite rod. Uh, and this was done by uh, Fourier much later in 1822. This uh, leads to analogous representations of functions on the real line as an integral of e to the i x c or sine x c plus i x c. These functions are called plane waves times some coefficient c of c. And the formula for c of c is given here as an integral. And this uh, function that takes c to the coefficient of f at c, which we now normally write f hat of c, is called the Fourier transform of the function f. Okay, 
So the fact that Fourier uh, formulated conjecture is true for many functions has been instrumental not only for these technological advances, but also for uh, theoretical advances. After all, I, I come from the University of Chicago where they sell t-shirts that say, okay, all that is well in practice, but what about the theory? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, this has been instrumental in the theoretical development of linear partial differential equations in the last 100 years. So what is Fourier's fa uh, actual idea to solve this initial value problem for the heat equation? Why did he uh, postulate this formula for every function? Because he says, if I then want to solve the heat equation because of linearity of the heat equation, that is to say, if you have one, if you have two solutions and you add them, you still have a solution, then it's enough to solve it for plane waves, for f of x equal to e to the i x c for each wavelength c. Because if you solve it for that, then you can add up all the solutions and you get the general solution with the coefficient c of c in front, as you add. So that represents a, a huge simplification because instead of having to solve this partial differential equation for all functions, I can just solve it for very special functions. And it turns out that for these very special functions, you can solve it right away. So for instance, for e to the i x c, the solution is given here by e to the i x c, e to the minus t x c squared over two. So that's the formula, and then you add all those up with multiplied by coefficients in c, and then you get the general solution. So this is the simplification I was talking about uh, at the beginning, the first simplification where instead of solving uh, for very complicated objects the problem, you solve it for special functions, and then you add everything up and you get the solution. And I, I, I guess I, I want to really make the point that this, besides having practical applications, it was instrumental in the development of uh, partial differential equations in the 20th century. Of course, uh, I guess one should mention that this idea of Fourier of representing a function in terms of special functions of some kind is also extremely important in its future incantations, for instance, in the wavelet decomposition, and that any of you who has used JPEG has used wavelets, so we all know how important that is. Okay. Okay. So, Nevertheless, this is strictly linear because we're dealing with equations of which the sum of two things who, which solve the equation still solve the equation. And we think that this represents the propagation of heat. But in fact, we are fooling ourselves because everywhere we, we look, there are also nonlinear effects. So, uh, we can't restrict, if we want to understand the world that's around us, we cannot restrict ourselves to only considering linear equations. We have to consider also nonlinear equations. And then this idea of, super, of superposition of solutions is no longer valid. Okay? So I'm going to discuss another uh, type of simplification that is conjectured to hold for a huge class of nonlinear partial differential equations which represent a huge class of physical phenomena. Okay? <coughs> 
So I will concentrate on a, a, on a class of nonlinear partial differential equations, uh, which is called dispersive equations. And these equations appear in, in connections with nonlinear phenomena of wave propagation. Okay? Nonlinear partial differential equations come in many, many different varieties, and it is not possible to have a theory that even attempts to cover all of them. So we have to somehow try to put in various buckets different kinds of equations and try to see if we can, in some way, find a way of dealing with the ones in each bucket at a time. Okay? And the bucket that I'm uh, deciding to discuss is the bucket of dispersive equations. And the reason for that is twofold. First, I've been working on that for the last 30 years. So I'm kind of fond of the topic. And uh, the second uh, reason is because there's a very interesting possibility of simplification uh, for this class of equations. And that's what I'd like to discuss. So uh, I will attempt to describe a little bit the theory of dispersive equations by discussing some of their uh, attributes. So we'll describe them by adjective. Um, there'll be some terms that are a bit technical, but don't be too concerned because eventually I'll move on and there won't be so many technical things. So the first thing about these nonlinear dispersive equations, even the linear dispersive equations, is that they are time reversible. You know, with the heat equation uh, the, that we discussed earlier, as time goes by, the temperature goes down, right? It becomes, so you cannot go back in time with them. For this class of equations, you can go back in time. So you can move in forward time or in backward time. Nevertheless, the linear dispersive equations can also be treated by Fourier's method. And we, in fact, use Fourier's method to treat the associated linear equations. Okay. Now, the equations that are of dispersive type and arise in physical phenomena usually have a conserved energy. And this gives rise to something that we call a Hamiltonian structure that I will not attempt to describe. But there are some quantities that are conserved in time, both for positive time and for negative time. And these are important uh, quantities for the motions that we're going to study. OK, so let me first do some, uh, a little bit of propaganda and tell you why these equations are important. They appear in the study of water waves. Uh, in nonlinear optics, lasers couldn't have been built without these equations. And we know how useful these lasers are, because I'm using one right now. <laughs> uh, uh, they appear in ferromagnetism, in nonlinear elasticity, <coughs> in particle physics, in general relativity, and in many models for these difficult physical theories. And they also have geometric incantations as flows, geometric flows, in various geometries uh, uh, like Kähler and Minkowski geometry. Now, uh, this study, these equations have been studied extensively in the last 40 years. And from my point of view, this is one of the most exciting areas in partial differential equations today. Even though, as we will see, these equations were really first introduced in the 19th century. So, OK, so here are some examples. Uh, if you get cross-eyed by looking at these equations, don't worry. Um, the first example is what we no call the correct, generalized correct de Vries equations, which model water waves in a shallow channel. And uh, here, the, these are real-valued functions that verify these 
uh, differential equations. And I lost my laser. <laughs> OK. Anyway, so you see in this correct Debris <laughs> equation, there's a linear part, dTU minus d squared, d cubed xU, which can be treated by Fourier's method. And then there's a nonlinear term, u to the k times dxU. And again, we study the initial value problem. The second uh, class of, uh, of equations are the so-called nonlinear Schrodinger equations that originate in quantum theory and are used to, to study optics, lasers, and ferromagnetism. And uh, hopefully, it hasn't died completely because I need to change the page. Not being able to, OK. There's also nonlinear versions of the wave equation, which is the same equation that we saw uh, uh, on Tuesday, but in higher dimensions. And then there are geometric examples where instead of having uh, functions with real values, you have functions val with values on geometric objects like spheres. And uh, they respect the invariances of, of the targets where they land. And this here, uh, the ones I have here are called uh, wave maps. And they are very important in analyzing certain aspects of general relativity. And they also uh, preserve ge uh, this Minkowski geometry. OK. So I've shown you some equations. Thank you. Did the battery die out, do you think? Yeah. Okay, Try that one. okay thank you. Yeah, it, it does work. So, it's so w why are these equations dispersive? Here I have a, a, a kind of long-winded explanation for it. And I don't think you should pay too much attention to it. Just assure yourself that there's a serious mathematical way of describing this. So these equations have a, first of all, the, they are dispersive if their linear part is dispersive. And the linear part is dispersive because when you solve it by the Fourier method, what happens is two things. Certain quantities get preserved. For instance, the mass gets preserved. It's constant in time. At the same time, the support of your function gets spread out. So if you spread out the support but maintain the mass constant, that means that the size has to decrease. So the solutions to dispersive equations have to decay in time as time progresses. And this is the picture that you have to have. Things get sp spread out in support and go down in time, but their total mass is constant, or the total energy is constant. OK, and you can ignore my formulas. All you, all you need to uh, remember is what I just said. Oh, this one works better. Now, the interesting thing that, well, at least it's interesting to me, that happens with these equations, as I said, dispersive equations are dis called dispersive because their linear parts are, is that for their nonlinear versions, the dispersion may not occur. And there are certain solutions which are very peculiar that arise, which do not go down in size as time goes by. And these are the so-called solitons, solitary waves, or traveling waves, which propagate just by translation. And this, these waves have been a mystery since the early 19th century. So these are solutions which do not change in, in shape and just move along, along a certain channel. And that's how they propagate. Okay.
So let me tell you the story of solitons. It's an interesting story. Okay. So the, the first recorded discovery of such an object was found by John Scott Russell, which, who was a Scottish engineer. He found them in 1834 going along one of the canals in Scotland on his horse. He was riding uh, along, and he saw this wave that was going very fast, but did not change in shape. And he followed it on his horse along the canal for many, many miles, and nothing happened. It, it was still remained the same. Okay. And he paid attention. Now it turns out that Russell was not the idea of an engineer that we have today. Um, he was a fellow of the Royal Society. He became a, a chaired professor at the University of Edinburgh when he was 24. Uh, he also designed ships. He designed the first armored fri fri frigate, 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 which was called the Warrior, and he also designed the, the largest steamboat that uh, that was in the mid 19th century, and it remained the largest one until the beginning of the 20th century. So this was a guy who had many many talents, and so he presented his findings the meeting of the Royal Society, and Airy and Stokes, who were fellow members of the Royal Society and were very famous mathematicians at the time, said that this was nonsense, that this, couldn't, this wasn't possible. There couldn't be such a, a solution to this water wave problems. And this is because they had developed theories that describe the motion of water waves that were linear. And if you have a linear theory, you will never have a solitary wave like this. And so since they couldn't explain them, they thought that they couldn't exist. Resa resounds today. OK. Uh, now, about 50 years later, Businesc and Ray Rayleigh put forward theories to explain Russell's observations, and finally, Businesc, and a little bit later, Corvec and de Vries formulated this Corvec de Vries equation that I showed you earlier, uh, that described the, the motion of shallow water waves, such as the one uh, observed by Russell many years earlier. But the essential properties of, of the solutions to these equations are of this. Uh, solitary waves were not understood at all. Okay.